Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bhaskar Sur. I'm a senior scientist in the SNP organization, and I'm also a past collaborator in the Sudbury Bufino Observatory experiment and the current collaborator on the dark matter experiment using argon pulse shape discrimination or DEEP, which is running at SNOLAB. I am uh, very pleased uh, that uh, Dr. Arthur McDonald is back here at Chalk River Laboratories. Uh, for most of us, of course, art needs no introduction. He's the winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of neutrino oscillations uh, at the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment, uh, as well as the winner along with the Sudbury Neutrino Obser Observatory experimenters. Uh, collaboration of the 2016 Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for the same uh, discovery. Uh, Talked about personnel were collaborators in the Sudbury Green Observatory experiment, uh, which also used a thousand tons of heavy water on loan from atomic energy to the energy. <clears throat> Art is uh, the winner of numerous other prizes, awards, and honors. Uh, that you can read about on his many biographies online. Uh, he is uh, also recipient of the Order of Ontario and the Order of Canada, among other things. Art is, of course, an alumnus of Chalk River Laboratories, having worked here from 1969 to 1982. Uh, from Chalk River, Art went on to become professor at Princeton University, and then in 89, he joined Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario where he continues as Emeritus Prof Professor. Uh, Art is back in Chalk River to attend the meeting of the dark matter experiment using argon pulse shape discrimination, the so-called deep experiment running at Snow Lab. And he has uh, uh, agreed to uh, speak today on understanding our universe from deep underground. Please welcome Art. Thank you very much, uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here. I drove the road, uh, I, I calculated roughly, I drove 6,000 times before between uh, Highway 17 and the plant uh, this morning and, and uh, uh, saw the turkeys again uh, coming across the road. It's, it's really nice to be back. Actually, we're back here, uh, my wife and I, we've been renting a cottage at the end of Birch Road for three weeks in July for the last 25 years. So uh, I'm no uh, stranger to this area, just haven't been in the plant in the interim. But it was great when I worked here. Uh, and uh, of course, that I went on to be a collaboration with a number of scientists here in Chalk River, as you'll learn with, res with respect to the snow experiment. And it's a pleasure to continue it with respect to the deep experiment, both of which I'll mention uh, here today. Um, and so, Vasco uh, mentioned the Nobel Prize and other prizes. I, I received them, particularly with the Nobel Prize, where they give it to mm -hmm. one person, but it really is the people that worked on these experiments that earned the prize. And, and I just try to represent them uh, in, in this circumstance. So, we've been fortunate to have been able to expand beyond the snow experiment that was started back in, uh, started construction in 19. 90 um, to the Snow Lab facility, which uh, was started construction around 2003, where we were able to expand the original snow uh, area. This is the snow detector. We'll see more later. Uh, this is the area where it was. We now have this much larger area with uh, four or five other major experiments where the principal uh, objective is, in fact, the study of dark matter, and we'll discuss that as well. This is two kilometers underground in the Creighton mine near Sudbury. It's also ultra clean. It's class 2000 in the entire laboratory, which makes it the deepest and clean, well, lowest in terms of cosmic rays and cleanest laboratory of this type anywhere in the world. And so, in fact, we're being targeted as a location of, of choice by major experiments internationally, $35 million US experiment coming in, uh, already started, and uh, uh, several uh, large, even larger experiments that are targeted for uh, the cube hall 
which is still waiting for its uh, uh, occupant. By being the lowest radioactivity location in the world, we can do things that you just can't do otherwise. And if you've got a hook on something, and in our case, it's low radioactivity, you can study a wide variety of things. It really takes you from the smallest scale to the largest scale in the universe. In particular, we started studying the sun. We could study particles called neutrinos that are produced in the core of the sun that penetrate through virtually anything, including the two kilometers of rock uh, above us. Uh, and once an hour made a signal in our detector, which enabled us then to make measurements of how the sun burns, as well as determine fundamental properties of the neutrinos themselves. Snow is being has been reconfigured to an experiment called Snow Plus with liquid scintillator in place of the heavy water we had in the central vessel uh, in the first place. And, and with that, uh, we can study pro basic properties of neutrinos themselves, but also study from the Earth neutrinos that are produced by uranium and thorium decay down for about 600 kilometers or so, and thereby measure one of the principal heat sources approximately 40% of the heat generated coming out of the Earth. Dark matter is something that has been identified now through its gravitational um, interactions in many different circumstances. But in particular, we think it's the principal thing that holds our, our present Milky Way galaxy in its present shape. You look out on a starry night, there's about five times as much mass from dark matter in between the stars as there is in the stars themselves. And that is what, what is, has become one of the principal objectives of future experiments in environments like this, but also has been dominating a lot of the astronomy community's activities. We see uh, in the larger scale, the influence of dark matter, which we used to think might be neutrinos, but we now know their mass is too small to qualify for that. So these dark matter particles, which have been shown in various astronomical situations to penetrate through large amounts of material as well, have become an objective in our experiments two kilometers underground. So we'll talk about that uh, as well. Now, the slide here, one of the other of these buttons. Oh, there, there we go. Yeah, look on your, if you look on your actual screen instead of the large screen part. Thank you, there you go. Okay, uh, but we can also go in the other direction, go into the tiny things inside uh, our, uh, uh, our Earth and also inside the elements that make up our Earth and us. Uh, we have, uh, of course, you know atoms with nuclei and electrons surrounding them. But in particular, we now have a model referred to as the standard model for elementary particles, which includes the components of the protons and neutrons that are inside the nucleus, they are brought there, made up of three quarks, respectively. Uh, and those quarks are shown in the standard model here in the first, what's called the gen first generation, up and down quarks. And they have equivalent, a, a light particle called a lepton called the electron, which pairs in that generation with them. And, and, and a neutrino, electron neutrino, that is associated with uh, the electron. When, when, oops, now I'm going to, sorry. I think you unmuted your, just mute your laptop. I think you just bumped it by accident. Okay. I mean, are you still hearing me up there? No, I don't. Very good. Good. Um, the, uh, uh, <laughs> electron neutrinos are emitted in processes that involve an electron. There are other types of neutrinos, but observed in other types of processes, typically at higher energies, where a muon or tau type of particle, which are more massive than neutrinos, emit a neutrino that's associated with them, referred to as muon or tau neutrinos. There are also heavier versions of the quarks. The forces are represented by these force carriers, the photon for electromagnetic, the uh, gluon for the strong, and the, the Z and W particles for the weak interactions. 
Each particle in this model also has a matching antiparticle, and we think that in the original Big Bang, energy was converted into equal numbers of particles and antiparticles. There's a big question today, and that is where is all that antimatter? Our universe is clearly dominated predominantly by matter. And one of the questions that we try to produce uh, information on is that question, what happened to the uh, transformation in the er early universe? And that's where the transformation of the snow experiment, the snow plus, is aimed at attempting to answer that. So dark matter looks nothing like any of these particles. If we are able to discover dark matter, we have an entirely new form of matter. So the implications of the measurements at the microscopic scale at the most fundamental level is substantial as well. So we're doing experiments that are complementary to what's being done at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. There, they are colliding at high energies, highest energies that particles have been able to collide so far. Particles hoping to make dark matter for the first time since the Big Bang. What we are attempting to observe is the dark matter that's left over from when there was a tremendous amount of energy in the Big Bang, which have been in our, they're stable and have been in our universe ever since. And in fact, we know they're there by their gravitational effects in a, forming our Milky Way galaxy. So that's the motivation for all of these uh, experiments we're, we're dealing with. And a uh, uh, simple way to move it forward, <laughs> not the computer. So let's start with the neutrinos in order to understand some of the things, in particular the, the, the snow project using these neutrinos. So as, I, as you saw, along with electrons and quarks, they're the basic particles, and we don't know how to subdivide them any, any further. They come in three flavors, and they only feel the weak force. They have no charge, they don't feel the strong force, and therefore they only stop if they hit the nucleus of an atom or an electron going around it head on. So for them, matter is open space. They can travel through the amount of lead corresponding to the distance that light travels in a year with only about a 50% chance of hitting one atom. So it's a very difficult process to observe them. So the detector we built, Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, is the size of a 10-story building with 1,000 tons of heavy water in the middle in order to observe one an hour of these neutrinos from the sun, even though there are billions being produced. And the type we were studying through a space of a square centimeter equivalent to your thumbnail, there are about five million of the type we were studying per second right now going through there. Standard model said that they shouldn't change from one type to another, from electron neutrinos to muon and tau neutrinos which is what we actually observed in the snow experiment. If they do that, there are arguments that say that they must have a mass greater than zero, both of which are uh, outside of the original standard model. And so we, by observing this, we've seen the first new piece of evidence as to how you have to make changes to the standard model. So this is what we built, the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory. It's two kilometers underground, it's 34 meters high, the cavity, and it is about uh, 22 meters in, uh, in diameter. In the middle, there's this transparent acrylic sphere holding a thousand tons of heavy water that we were able to borrow uh, for uh, a dollar and a million dollars a year insurance, but anyway, uh, <laughs> for about uh, 10 years in order to do the experiment. That was looked at by almost 10,000 light sensors looking in for faint bursts of light where that one event per hour that uh, the neutrinos were creating in the detector. This is all in a cavity that was lined with a material that's both water and radon uh, impermeable. And, uh, and then that, that water and the heavy water itself was, was purified to the point that it was about a billion times purer than ordinary tap water. You had one radioactive decay per day per ton of water, uranium and thorium in the center volume filled with the heavy water. This, of course, was a major engineering 
exercise, a uh, very major engineering exercise that took a number of years. And the engineering for this actually was uh, uh, was done here at Chalk River. In fact, Chalk River was very actively involved in the project in the early stages. Uh, the original spokespersons for the project were Herb Chen from U UC Irvine uh, in the United States and George Ewan from, from Queens here in Canada. George actually was for a long time a scientist here at, uh, uh, at Chalk River. And in fact, I ended up taking his position when I came here in 1989. George is, was the first person here at Chalk River to use a germanium detector for the detection of gamma rays which has revolutionized the ability to do uh, medicine and a variety of other things using gamma detection. David Sinclair joined us in 1985. Uh, I was involved from the start, but became the US uh, director in 1987 when Herb Chen unfortunately passed away at a very early age. Dave Earl was the principal person here at Chalk River. And there are a number of people that I'll show you later, including Baskar, who were actively involved in the project. The design for snow was done here at Chalk River, <clears throat> headed by a team, or where a team was headed by uh, uh, Ted McFarland in plant design here at uh, Chalk River. And uh, uh, he went on later to become the head of engineering at Snowland. The scientific question that we uh, set out to answer, I go back to here, was actually formulated here at Chalk River. Bruno Pontecorvo, he eventually found a uh, Chalk River internal report that was in that building that's behind these people. That's the old library. And in fact, the auditorium that I expected to be speaking in, if it hadn't already been turned down with this fantastic renovation that's going on here at Chalk River. Bruno Corvo in 1948 wrote a paper in which he said chlorine could be used to detect neutrinos from the sun. He also then went on in 1957 to say that a possible uh, effect that could mess up your ability to measure those neutrinos is if neutrinos change from one flavor to another, which at that point he was put on his way to show was was quite possible. And so, in fact, there was an experiment that uh, was based on his ideas run by a fellow named Ray Davis, who did an experiment uh, in the Homestake mine in the United States using a large tank of chlorine. And he found too few neutrinos compared to what was calculated as the best models of how the sun burns by a factor of about three or so. So this became to be known as the solar neutrino problem. Either the calculations were wrong, which meant you didn't really understand how the sun was burning, which was significant even for fusion power here on Earth because it's the same thing, except you're not confining with gravity, you're confining with magnetic fields here on Earth in Takamax. Or else what Potokoro proposed may have been true, that electron neutrinos changed into other flavors as they traverse the distance from the core of the sun through the sun and here to Earth. That would have been outside the standard model, and therefore was not exactly the preferred result as far as particle physicists were concerned. Herb Chen actually made the proposal that perhaps we could get enough heavy water to do the experiment. He initially proposed 4,000 tons, which would have been $1.2 billion. and would have used, I think, all of the reserves available in Canada at the time. But it turned out that by the use of this acrylic vessel, we were able to do it with a thousand tons. The reason why heavy water is useful is that you can measure two things. One reaction, which you see here, where you see light from a fast moving electron produced by the electron neutrino interacting with that neutro extra neutron in deuterium and producing a Cherenkov cone of light uh, that you can detect with your detector, or the neutrino of any type simply breaking apart deuterium into a neutron and a proton, and uh, you, you end up with a free neutron in your detector. And we had three different ways of detecting that signal that uh, differentiated between the two. 
if you compare then the two rates, if in fact electron neutrinos are the whole thing, then the two rates should 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 match up because that uh, unknown neutrino type for the second reaction is simply an electron neutrino. Instead, what we observed is that there were three times fewer of the first reaction than the second reaction. This had to be done very carefully because this is where uranium and thorium comes into it. Any gamma ray greater than about 2.2 MeV can do the same thing as that second reaction. So we had to have less than one decay per day per ton of water of uranium and thorium, particularly in the heavy water, in order for the experiment to be successful. And we were able to do that and also measure the uranium and thorium content with a variety of techniques so that we could do it accurately. So our results from the SNOW experiment essentially were that if you compare, in this case, the plot is neutrino flux or numbers of neutrinos per square centimeter per second. And the question is, what are the two, the first reaction that should be sensitive only to electron neutrinos or the second reaction sensitive to all neutrino types? And how do they compare with the prediction of a little over five in those mm -hmm. units or the models of the sun, standard solar models, as it's as it's abbreviated there. But Bacall, the, the aforementioned individual and others, turns out that all neutrino types matched up very accurately with the calculations of the sun. The ones that were explicitly electron neutrinos were only one third of the total. And we were able to do that with enough accuracy that it's less than one chance in 10 million that neutrinos were not changing from one flavor to the others. That's five standard deviations, which has turned out to be the, uh, the standard in particle physics for considering it to be a discovery. And that is, that is what the Nobel Prize was awarded for, particularly the implication that you have to change the standard model in order to get neutrinos put into it. Neutrinos do not follow the usual Higgs mechanism that gives mass to all the other particles in the standard model. They have to have a different mechanism. And uh, that is uh, an important question. And so that's the first result that was significant. The second result that was significant is the fact that the total number of neutrinos coming from the sun match the calculations very accurately, better than 10% at the present time. And that's very, very satisfying when you're attempting to do fusion power, as I said earlier, confined by magnetic fields, as opposed to by gravity in this case. We also know now that neutrinos are not the dark matter that I described earlier that we'll discuss in more detail. And that led to the establishment of Snow Lab. It was recognized that the work that was done with snow meant that the site in Sudbury was of sufficient quality that it was worth expanding it. It was a part of a program that Canada Foundation for Innovation put forward where they wanted to build a laboratory that would bring scientists from other countries to come and work with Canadians here in Canada. And that's really what's happening substantially now. And so we were able to go on to build snow labs but the people that were involved in doing this experiment, which as I say, are the people that really, um, if they split Nobel Prizes, should uh, be uh, regarded in, in the same way as I am. Uh, but in, included in those people are a number of people who are indicated here in red, who were from Chalk River. And so Chalk River made a number of contributions, as I indicated, uh, there's another one who should be on this list, but he's a, this is a list of scientists, and that's Ken McFarlane and other members of the plant design team who really did original design for uh, personnel. You may note that uh, Oscar Sir's name is on this list. And Davis Earl, who unfortunately is no longer with us. So we've now converted the snow experiment to have much more light output by using a liquid scintillator instead of heavy water in the central region. And we can get 50 to 100 times more light output uh, by doing so. 
And the idea is then to dissolve in that a material that is a candidate for what's called neutrinoless double beta decay. The liquid scintillator, unfortunately, is lower specific gravity than water. And so instead of holding up this, well, obviously heavier water inside the acrylic sphere in the first place, uh, we have to hold it down. And that led to a significant amount of effort, for example, to do drills, drilling into the bottom of the cavity, all being done in these ultra clean conditions. And we now, that has happened and we've been running for a while uh, with the detector reconfigured. In particular, now we have all of the liquid scintillator in and the measurements that are being done are testing the background for this next process. The trainless bubble beta decay occurs in a select number of nuclei where energetically you can't have a single uh, beta particle being emitted, which is the more common uh, beta decay that you uh, uh, are familiar with and everything from, well, the things that are used for uh, uh, medical diagnosis, including PET scanners where positrons are used uh, along with uh, neutrinos in all cases, although they're never observed. In the case where you have the energetic, energetics right for the decay that emits two electrons, it's just double beta decay, you would expect also two neutrinos to be emitted. But in some cases, if the neutrinos and their, their properties are such that they could be their own antiparticle, if that's the case, then the neutrino that would be emitted would annihilate with the anti-neutrino before it leaves the nucleus. At least that's a simple way of looking at the process. If that's the case, then if you sum up the energy of the two electrons that are emitted, then what you find is that it's monoenergetic. And if you have a way, as we do in the, the Snow Plus experiment, to observe the total energy of those electrons that are emitted, then you'll see from this process where two neutrinos are emitted as well, and therefore energy is carried away, a continuum of energy. But for the case where you only have the two electrons being emitted, you sum up their energy, you have a peak. <clears throat> it's a very difficult experiment to do. People are trying to do it with different examples of uh, double beta decay nuclei uh, around the world. And it's, it's difficult because in order to get to the current sensitivity, which is a, what a million times smaller mass than the mass of an electron, you need to measure something that has a lifetime of about something greater than 20, 10 to the 26 years. Now that's a long time to wait. <laughs> to see this happen, but then you put it in perspective when you think that, uh, you know, for a molecular weight of a material, Avogadro's number tells you that you've got 10 to the 23 atoms available. So if you have tons of material, as we will, as we do have in uh, Snow Plus, then you've got enough to wait for maybe five years for a sensitive measurement. And that's what we're doing uh, in the next two years is putting Tellurium into the uh, uh, into the liquid scintillator uh, for the current limit, which is at about a tenth of an electron volt, or a little more than a million times smaller than the mass of an electron. Then you would see this red signal. There would be backgrounds of a variety of things, including this continuum from the two neutrino background. If the uranium and thorium is very much under control. And ironically, one of the backgrounds is this, these neutrinos from the sun, which are called boron-8 neutrinos uh, that actually form a background. Following the half percent, which is the four tons or about 1,300 kilograms of the isotope of interest, fluorium-130, that's about 36% natural abundance. We hope to be able to move up to 3% fluorium, in which case we'll have an even, even uh, stronger sensitivity. It turns out that we know from the, the oscillations that the differences in mass between the three neutrino, uh, three masses associated with the three neutrino types, they are known and they're small. We don't know the absolute value, and it's the absolute value that has an effect in terms of how neutrinos contribute to the evolution of the universe. 
And this would give us a handle on the absolute value, as well as telling us whether neutrinos are their own anti antiparticle, which also is of significance in the early phases of the evolution of the universe. Which is now thought to happen in the following way. This is the Big Bang Theory, uh, not the TV program. This is actually the Big Bang Theory. Uh, it's thought that about 13 and a half billion years ago, there was an enormous explosion and expansion, tremendous amount of heat, temperatures on the order of 10 to the 27 or higher Celsius, uh, enough energy to produce all of the particles that we know so far. Typically, the thought is they're produced in matter-antimatter pairs. Neutrinos and antineutrinos, electrons and positrons and so on. We don't know back then what caused all the matter to decay away, but there is a mechanism associated with the, the uh, most common theory for how neutrinos get their mass, referred to as a seesaw mechanism, which combined with some other properties that are under study in other places, including, for example, the fact that Fermilab principally is looking at the uh, symmetry that uh, neutrinos may exhibit that would enable them to participate in this antimatter decay. And so neutrino physics has really become a substantial part of the particle physics world these days. Those are so-called long baseline os oscillation experiments. But neutrinos dull beta decay can give some very specific parts of the theory to try to understand this unusual process. So what happens in the, in the understanding of how the universe has evolved these days, and it's the last 30 years in a combination of astronomical and other measurements have enabled us to put forward a picture like this, is that after about 10 to the minus six seconds, these particles uh, begin to cool off the expansion after the Big Bang, and quarks come together and plump into protons and neutrons, after three minutes, they become atoms, pardon me, they become nuclei. And after about 300,000 years, it's cool enough that the electrons can attach to those nuclei, forming neutral atoms. And it's, that's the point where light can shine through. So if you've heard about the cosmic microwave background, then that is a study of the light at that point in the evolution of the universe. And what's learned is through the distribution of that light. How homogeneous is it across uh, all the sky? Um, actually, if you're old enough like I am to have had a TV with just an antenna tuned to channel three, the snow that you would see on that old TV is in fact that same cosmic microwave background or bits of it. And so uh, uh, it's not so unfamiliar to humans as it turns out if they only knew what they'd been looking at. <laughs> I looked at the snow on the TV until the first program came on when we got our first TV in Sydney, Nova Scotia in 1953, so I remember that very well. <laughs> okay, after that, then there's the formation of stars and galaxies. And in that process, both neutrinos and dark matter particles have a significant effect. The theories uh, of how this coming together of the uh, uh, structure formation, as they say, depend on the properties of neutrinos in terms of their mass and also the uh, dark matter, which makes up a large fraction of the universe. In fact, we think it's about 26% of the total. I think we, that is ordinary matter, are only about 4%. The remainder is what's called dark energy. And dark energy is the fact that your high school teacher in physics taught you that gravity is always an attractive force between two masses. Well, in the last 20 years or so, it's been determined pretty definitively that if you go on a large scale, there's actually a repulsive part of it as well. Einstein actually had it in there in his theory, but eventually took it out thinking that it wasn't right. There's studies of, of Supernova at very large distances have observed that there's an extra acceleration force that is pushing 
the expansion of the universe, and that can be expressed in forms of in a form of energy called dark energy. But concentrating on dark matter, we're able to study what can be 26% of the universe and doesn't fit into any of our models so far. And so it's a fascinating thing to do. Again, the Large Hadron Collider has this as a significant goal of moving the energy up to try to see if they could create it for the first time. I mentioned earlier that you can see dark matter influencing, in fact, our own Milky Way. And if you haven't, uh, if you're not that familiar with, uh, with the Milky Way, when you look out on the starry night, you see a, a band of stars across the sky. You're looking at a pancake on its edge. It actually, if you see it from the side, as other galaxies display themselves to us, it's a pancake with sort of a spiral formation in it. And if you plot the stars as a bunch of distance out from the center, and they're, pardon me, they're, if you plot the velocity of the stars as a function of their distance out from the center, you see something that looks like this. If it was simply the gravity associated with this glowing matter, that was influencing those the trajectories of those stars, you would expect that curve to look like this. The implication is there's about five times as much dark matter as there is ordinary matter, and that's what we're after in our experiments at uh, a lot of our experiments at Snow Lab, including the deep experiment for which we're having this meeting here at uh, Chuck River. Snow Lab is a significant expansion, about three times the excavated volume as the original snow experiment shown over here. All of these additional uh, facilities were created uh, starting in about 2003 and going into operation around 2009-10. Um, there are many experiments going on there, a number of them aimed at dark matter. And in fact, it's very interesting that the types of experiments all of them have a particular reason or a particular aspect to their choice of material that enables them to get rid of radioactivity in addition to being clean and two kilometers underground. But they represent a number of different materials where you're presenting the material, hoping that the dark matter particles as they as we move through uh, the dark matter in our galaxy, will interact with the material and give you a signal. And what we're dealing with here in, uh, at this meeting is, is liquid argon. News deals with light material in the form of a gas, could be as light as helium. Super CDMS, which is this 35 million experiment I'm talking about that's about to start uh, installation uh, in this location, is using silicon and germanium. PICO, which has one of the best sensitive, well, it has the best sensitivity in the world for the interaction of dark matter with material if it happens through a magnetic interaction, it uses fluorine. We've covered the spectrum of dark matter detection. And again, it's, it's silicon for these detectors. And so we're hoping that in one of these detectors, we will see a signal. This is what Snow Lab looks like. It's ultra clean everywhere, class 2000. Uh, this this is a picture that shows you the cryo pit, which we're waiting for an occupant. Uh, we expect within the next couple of years, there are a couple of major international experiments that want to be cited there. This is when Stephen Hawking visited us for the second time in 2012. Uh, he was adamant about wanting to go underground when he came to Sudbury and see everything. And uh, we uh, dispensed with the requirements for everybody that everybody else had, that is, when you go underground, you take a shower and wear these lint-free clothing. We, we vacuumed them off above ground and then Inko had a special car uh, to take them underground. Um, this is the deep experiment. Uh, you can see a large water tank, eventually filled with water, and the central region, which is essentially similar to uh, snow in the sense that the liquid argon is in the middle. There are light sensors, photomultiplier tubes, so-called, looking in at the central volume through some light pipes. This is at 87 Kelvin, or about minus 210 degrees Celsius, liquid argon. And its properties are, are particularly uh, advantageous 
for this experiment because if a nucleus recoils, the light comes out in the order of seven nanoseconds or so. Whereas gammas and betas produce light that comes out over a period of up to uh, several microseconds. We can discriminate against the gammas and betas by a factor of 10 to the eighth, simply by taking the ratio of the prompt light to the total light. And this is a demonstration using neutrons to simulate a to create a nuclear recoil and gamma rays from a radioactive source. Here we have a complex device, uh, very carefully engineered. Uh, the Chalk River people uh, were particularly involved in dealing with the muon veto aspect of the experiment with the signal coming from that water tank that I showed you in the previous, uh, uh, previous figure. In order to make it as clean as possible, we had something engineered that quite similar to the sorts of things that Chalk River does to deal with unusual circumstances in dealing with reactors. In this case, a resurfacer, which was this, this bar with spinning sanders on either end that originally was vertical. The, these bars were, were vertical so that we could come down to the very narrow neck and then they twist it up so that they could sand the inner surface of the vessel and then it went around in such a way that it covered the entire inner surface and sanded off about a half a millimeter in the inner region, which we then collected and took the radioactivity that had accumulated from radon daughters during construction. So we looked at the prompt light versus the amount of light given out. 200 days of data in our first uh, set of data. We're actually analyzing a second set. A lot of discussions this morning on that topic. The uh, nuclei are expected to occur in this, uh, nuclear recoils in this region here. The uh, gamma rays uh, appear in a very different region, much lower. And in that 230 days, we saw no events enabling us to set a significant limit. And this is the set of Chop River um, um, collaborators who are involved in this experiment and in our meetings today. This is being expanded to include other experiments. The next one being a, one that's about 10 times bigger than the three tons we have in um, Sudbury uh, at uh, the Dr. Grand Sasso lab in Italy. The objective eventually is 10 times bigger than that at uh, uh, in Snow Lab. The one in Grand Sasso, which was under a mountain in uh, about three hours east of Rome, under the Grand Sasso mountain, uh, uses an external cryostat filled with liquid argon at, from the atmosphere. The inner region is a region where you not only look at the light out using new generation of detectors called silicon photomultipliers, but you also drift put an electric field on this and drift the resulting uh, electrons that are produced by the uh, events in the detector and collect an additional signal uh, by allowing them to produce extra light in the gas region at the top of the detector, giving us uh, more information to discriminate against background. Here's the sensitivity we can obtain. Plotted here is what we call a cross section for the interaction of dark matter particles with a nucleon in the various materials, in this case, carbon. And you can see that this is the result from our first results from uh, D3600. We're projecting that our ultimate sensitivity could be in this vicinity. These are results from using xenon. There's a new result from the LZ experiment in this vicinity, which suggests that they will get to their projected sensitivity in this vicinity. Dark side will be a little bit better than that. Argo eventually will be down at the point where when you plot it this way, it is where neutrinos interfere with the, uh, with the experiment. So it's pretty well the ultimate sensitivity for this sort of detection for dark matter. And so far, nothing has been seen. And so we still don't know what dark matter is, but we're hopeful. 
Now, let me just finish up by talking about a, a project that we did in 2020, where Chalk River was a very key participant. Uh, we realized very early in the in the pandemic, actually by the leader of the Dark Side uh, project, who was locked down in Milan, if you remember, as one of the first hotspots for COVID, that maybe we had the expertise and the and the collaboration, perhaps augmented by others. And, Jock River was certainly one of the augmentations that made a big difference um, to build a new type of ventilator because ventilators were in short supply. The only ones that were available were uh, uh, very expensive, uh, multi purpose. In order to ramp up and build more of them, the supply chain under COVID became a real problem because there were thousands of parts in them. And so the idea was build something simple that works for intubated people in the ICU already, which is when you really need a ventilator of this type. And so we set about doing that. Um, the uh, um, I was involved with a, a, an excellent group here in, in Canada, which Chalk River was a significant participant, along with Triumph and all that, and people at this institute at uh, Queens that uh, Tony Noble created, and they named after me, <laughs> Mr. Justice and Hunt. Um, <laughs> Maxos is the Canadian company we work with, and along with JMP Solutions, and Alamaster is the uh, Italian company that we work with as well. And that was a very important part of the whole thing. This is what the final ventilator looks like. Tony has made, Tony Noble has created a, uh, a wonderful uh, set of slides to show you that it's very simple in principle. You let the oxygen in by opening one valve, close it, the carbon dioxide go out, when you open the exit valve and then you close it. But in practice, what you do is something much more complicated. Okay, you have to control those valves. But when you get into trying to produce something that's going to be responsible for keeping someone who's very sick breathing, you have to be much more careful. Even the software you're dealing with, it was a tremendous advantage for us to have software specialists from CNL who knew how to work to ISO rules because that's what they do when they're developing software for nuclear reactors. And they came in and helped us to make our software uh, the sort of thing that's necessary in order to get medical certification. So not just opening and closing the valves, you had to measure the pressures in order to do that. You had to monitor for flow, you had to look for leaks, you had to adjust, had to have a supply of oxygen at the appropriate percentage, and you also had to make sure that there's safety on all of such things. We even put in a separate CPU redundant in order to make sure that uh, it dealt with any problem and would ring an, an alarm so that the respiratory therapist would know there's some problem with the patient or us. very well, but only through the teamwork associated, first of all, with the medical specialists who actually knew what was needed and advised us on how to do that. We had very close cooperation with the manufacturing companies, both in Italy and here in Canada. Uh, we had tremendous technical assistance, and this is where Chuck River really came in with a wide variety of experience able to focus on the problem. We had to meet the standards made put forward by the FDA and by Health Canada and the Canadian Standards Association. We had some donations from Canadian donors early in the project when we needed to lock in supplies in a difficult supply chain situation. This is what it looked like. We look at the final uh, figure, which was published open source, so that if people in other countries want to try to reproduce it, then they can do so. And this is the author list, and I've underlined the Chalk River participants to so you can see how significant uh, uh, membership there was from Chalk River. Uh, I'll mention, uh, I'll just mention one person, and that's Mitch King, who was uh, an engineer who retired last year and was the uh, integration engineer uh, at the head of uh, 
of doing things. So the drawings as we were moving forward were all made here at Chalk River and, and transmitted internationally because all of this was done on Zoom. Plus the people, many of the people listed here went into the laboratory here at Chalk River in the midst of COVID and set up a test system and uh, contributed to the development. Schedule, we started in March 19th. We had Health Canada submission by the 30th of July, eventual approval by the 30th of September. Canadian Standards Association went back and asked us to redo it all because we hadn't happened to do it in the lab that they had that they were familiar with. So all over again by November 30th, it was approved. We had a government contract and eventually delivered 7,000 of them. And uh, we uh, now have them in the Canadian stockpile and they're available for donation to other countries when requested. So my final word is many thanks to my Chuck River and CNL and general colleagues, both for snow and for deep and for the ventilator project. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, now, uh, Dr. McDowell and those online, we are taking questions. Uh, we have a couple that have come in, and for those that are gathered in the room, if you just want to come uh, a little closer to the microphone than where you are, we can take some questions. Uh, but maybe I'll start with the first one. So, uh, Dr. McDonald, how is the community leveraging the recent James Webb telescope data to augment the experiments being performed? Well, uh, one of the things that's very valuable about the James Webb telescope is the fact that uh, the sensitivity of the telescope enables you to go back to the faintest stars, which given that evolution are the ones that are farthest away and therefore that's why they're faint. So you're getting back in time effectively to those uh, periods when galaxies are being formed and so on. So the understanding of how structure is formed is uh, informed by the James Webb uh, telescope uh, in the uh, measurements that they're making. And so it, it all ties together in understanding how dark matter comes into it, the overall makeup of our universe uh, because the formation of galaxies and so on are an important part of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question online, and again, if there's questions in the room, please come forward. Uh, for the original snow experiment, was any treatment required of the heavy water to reduce tritium contamination? Are there any similar concerns with natural radioactive isotopes in the liquid scintillator for the current experiment? Uh, two questions. Two questions. First question about tritium in the uh, in the heavy water. It turns out that all uh, heavy water that uh, uh, AECL had at the time had been upgraded in the uh, same facility that was upgrading uh, re reactor uh, water, water that had been in reactors. And of course, in Canadian can do reactors, you end up producing significant amounts of tritium. And uh, it wasn't possible to get the amount of tritium uh, in the ACL water low enough for us, fine for normal handling, but we wanted essentially no tritium in, the, in, in it, uh, several hundred times lower than, the, than even the, the, uh, the standard for human handling. And so the water was traded with Ontario Hydro, at least that's what it was called at the time. Uh, and so all of that water actually came from Bruce, uh, from the heavy water plant that took it directly out of the lake. And uh, uh, AECL then uh, uh, received, uh, I should say, uh, Ontario Hydro, which only cares about using it in their reactors, received heavy water from AECL in exchange. And uh, so we had cooperation from Ontario Hydro as well as AECL in terms of the use of heavy water. In the case of the radioactivity in the liquid scintillator, that's a very big question. And we have a variety of ways in which we purify the scintillator, a very complicated uh, purification plant underground that's essential to try to get the level of purity that we need for the Snow Plus experiment. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions we have online. Are there any in the room? If not, then I think we can call it there. You're off the hook. Thank you very much, Dr. McDonald, for your time today. Thank you.
left according to my watch. <laughs> we want to have a little bit of fun, which we do sometimes with uh, with this. Uh, you know, what I've just been trying to do in, in an hour is a rather complex thing to try to uh, to explain. But uh, uh, this hour is uh, uh, 22 minutes. I uh, managed to compress it into about a, a it's three minutes. It's illustrious list, including Lester B. Pearson, Alice Monroe, and now a guy from Cape Breton. <laughs> Physicist Arthur McDonald is Canada's latest winner of a Nobel Prize. Here to explain why he's the best in the world at what he does is Art McDonald. Hi, I'm Art McDonald. I'm a professor emeritus at Queen's University, originally from Cape Breton, and I attended Dalhousie University. And I'm a co-winner of the 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, people from uh, 22 Minutes have asked me to come in and explain what uh, I and our team did to win this prize. We demonstrated that the flavor of neutrinos produced in the core of the sun, electron neutrinos, changed into one of the other two flavors, muon and tau neutrinos, as they traveled from the core of the sun to... Uh, okay, I'm, I'm being told I have to make it simpler. Um, neutrinos are very basic subatomic particles that we don't know how to subdivide any further and okay they're asking me to uh dumb it down a little bit um uh, some atomic particle is uh, smaller than an atom atom is a unit of matter really you don't know what matter is it's seven okay uh, neutrinos are like timbits Sometimes they're like chocolate, uh, sometimes they're like um, uh, cherry filled, and sometimes they're like the uh, old fashioned glaze. I must be the first person that ever won a Nobel Prize in Timbit. They, they wrote the script listening to me trying to explain it over the preceding three or four days, the week after the announcement of the Nobel Prize. So, uh, anyway, uh, you can have fun with that sometime. <laughs> All right. Thank you once again.